be very shortly. <laughs> and we're live. Welcome to the April 4th, 2024 meeting of the Finance and Facilities Committee of the University of Rhode Island Board of Trustees. The meeting is being held in person with committee members participating remotely. At this time, Board Secretary Michelle Carreri will conduct the roll call of attendance. Determine if the quorum is present. Please clearly respond present via WebEx or present in person when your name is. Vahid Onjazieri. Present via WebEx. Armin Sabatoni. Present WebEx. Maria Ducharme. Present by WebEx. Michael Fasciatelli. Present via WebEx. Joseph Formacola. Present via WebEx. Courtney Nicolato. Melissa Sutherland. Mark Parlange. Present via WebEx. Board Chair Margo Cook is also present and participating as an invited guest. And a quorum is present, so we can call the meeting to order. A uh, reminder to all members for the benefit of our audience and the note taker, please clearly identify yourself whenever you come comment, make a motion or second the motion. Participants using WebEx are required to keep their cameras on as remote members and all persons present at the meeting location must clearly be audible and visible to the other. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that University of Rhode Island occupies the traditional stomping ground of the Narragansett Nation and the Niantic people. And uh, something more con contemporary, I'd like to also recognize and congratulate uh, Abby Benson on her appointment to be the Vice President of Administrative Finance. At the permanent level, Abby, thank you. Google, I mean, up. Congratulations. Sure. We're looking forward to working with you. Congrats. Can we clap on board like they just like this? There we go. So uh, the first order of business is the approval of the minutes of uh, the February 5th Finance and Facilities Committee meetings. This is all and so moved. May I have a second? Joe so Formal call a second. Uh, any discussion, any questions? There'd be no discussion. I ask for a voice vote. All in favor, please say yes. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Um, item, item item number two, the discussion items. Uh, item number one is the projected FI24 performance versus budget and IBB update. Abby, please take it away. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I know we have a lot to cover, so I'm going to try to go quickly through these presentations. Uh, I Abby, I can't hear you. I don't know if the other people are, you're coming up very low. Can other people hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear yes. you. Yes, yes. You fine. Yep. I can too. Okay. Um, I'm going to keep going, Bahi, if that's okay. No, no, it's good. No, no, I, I hear you now. Okay. I think you just. I just wanted to share, we have a, I know we have a lot on the agenda today, so I'm going to uh, kind of move quickly through these, but of course, welcome your questions and I'm available after the meeting if there are further questions. Uh, so this is an item that's on the uh, calendar for each year is to give an update on our projected forecast for the end of the fiscal year. So I'm hoping, Michelle, that ITS can share the slides. Yes. Great. Thank you. So uh, our financial strategy and planning team uh, is looking regularly throughout the year about how we think we're going to land at the end of the fiscal year. This is a very high level summary of that. So what you see here is a table that uh, provides what the FY24 budget was and then a range for what we think is a kind of a, if we could go back to that first slide, um, the least likely case and the most likely case. So if you look on the first column, that's our FY24 budget. Uh, and this is again focused on our education in general, sort of our 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 fund 100, not necessarily research and auxiliary and other funds. Uh, we see that we are uh, in the budget. We were expecting 512.6 million for revenue, uh, and in the least likely case, we see that we will see an increase to 520, and the most likely an increase to 523.2. So that's an increase to the positive in revenue. And I'll talk more about that in the next slide. We also, uh, we didn't budget for this in FY24, but we got an unexpected increase from the state uh, relative to our state assessed fringe. So we 
uh, pay into the state's uh, fringe program. And sometimes they do kind of a right sizing and then they'll uh, deduct or give us more funding based on where we landed relative to the broader state pool. So that was a one time inf uh, influx of state funds of 2.7 million uh, for a subtotal uh, range of 522.7 to 526. So these are, these are all to the positive on the revenue side. The expense projection, uh, we were planning for 516.7 million. Uh, we are also seeing that our expenses are coming in a little lower than anticipated. So the range we're anticipating is 514.6 million to 509.7 million. And we uh, here have another uh, 1.5 million. That's an adjustment based on compensated absences. So that's actually a kind of an increase in expense that we uh, weren't anticipating. But at the end of the day, if you look at the bottom line, I think you all know we have a budgeted operating shortfall of 4.1 million, but we are planning at the end of the year to end up in the positive anywhere between 6.6 .6 to 14.8. So that is good news, but I want to talk about what are the some of the factors are uh, feeding into that. And much of this is kind of a one time increase, not necessarily a perpetual increase. So if we could go to the next slide, I'll, I'll talk about that. So what are some of the favorable things feeding into our revenue projections? I would say undergraduate tuition, we have an amazing enrollment management team and we uh, have put in place some new tactics to kind of increase our enrollment. So that came in favorably. Interest income, I think many of you know that that's been in, in the positive. That's not something we can rely on in the long term. And then summer winter tuition has also been favorable. I would say unfavorable is graduate tuition. This is an area I think you've heard the president we wanna grow. We were hoping to see some increases this year. This is going to be a focus in the out years, but we didn't quite get where we were hoping to on graduate tuition. The state assessed fringe, as I mentioned, was favorable, but that was a one time kind of unexpected influx. On the expenses, the favorable is personal savings and also just um, operating budget uh, decreases for expenses. Um, I want to talk about the personal savings because the large majority of what we see uh, being our projected increase at the end of FY24 is really unfilled positions. So budgeted, but unfilled. And there are a number of reasons for that. Some of those are related to academic positions that we got. We got a big bump in FY24 from the general assembly, but sometimes when we actually get that funding, it's a little too late to hire for the academic cycle because we get those funds in the middle of the summer. So a lot of those positions have been filled throughout the year and we'll see them more reflected in FY25. And then in addition, as I think we've shared in the past, we've, um, we haven't put a hiring freeze in, but we've not allowed units to use uh, vacancy savings for operating budget. So there are a lot of sort of vacancy savings budgeted, but unfilled positions that are kind of sitting on our books, uh, which allows us to end in a positive way at the end of the year. But that's obviously not where we wanna be. Generally, we wanna be budgeting and filling our positions as we go through the year. Uh, I mentioned the anticipated compensated absences that was unfavorable. Well, we're working between our financial strategy and planning team and our controller about how we can better anticipate this and budget for it. So we have a planning factor going forward. But the bottom line takeaway is that we we're going to end in a positive way, which we're pleased about, but about two thirds of that impact is one time in nature. So not something we can plan on. Uh, and wherever we land will definitely inform our FY25 uh, projections and allocations. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have on that. Okay, if there's one more slide. I wanted to give a brief update on the incentivized budget, uh, incentivized base budget model status updates. So you're gonna hear a lot more about this from the president at the board meeting, but I know Many of you have been getting questions about this. Just as a reminder, this is a project that's uh, changing how we allocate funds internally. So when funds come into the university, whether it's tuition and fees, research dollars, state appropriation, how are we allocating to schools and colleges and administrative units? So uh, John Pullman and his team have been working really diligently to help build this model uh, with the support of a steering committee that involves faculty reps and deans. The model, there's kind of an initial model that's built and we're in the stakeholder engagement phase. So we're gonna be participating in town halls over the next few months with all the colleges and faculty groups and administrative units just to kind of explain the model. And then we're gonna enter into FY25, which will be a transition year that will inform our kind of go live date, which will be July 1 of 25, which is FY26. 
So I wanted to just mention it that this is ongoing. I think the president will talk more about it uh, at the full board meeting, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about this as well. Abby, do we have um, um, uh, like model cases of other institutions that have gone through this that we are um, talking to or have the benefit of what worked and what didn't work? I would say uh, we do. So we've been paying a lot of attention to that because as, as some of you have heard, we've received feedback about, you know, I think people have heard anecdotally about what other schools have done and what's worked and what hasn't. So we've tried to incorporate what we know the concerns are into the model development and brought those concerns to the steering committee and also included them in guiding principles. For example, let's not have redundant course offerings in two colleges just so they're trying to get more you know, credit hour uh, funding. We have also, we have a consultant, as many of you know, here on that's supporting this. And we've actually, as part of our stakeholder engagement, asked them to sort of memorialize. They've, they've done this work at 60 plus schools, some case studies about other schools and challenges they've run into so that we can share those more proactively with the communities so they know that we're paying attention to it and we want to address it so we don't end up in a, a similar situation. Every budget might be unique to the university. You know, it's not going to be URI's budget model, so it won't be exactly the same, but we know some of the big pitfalls. I, I would just throw out a suggestion that that maybe in some of these town halls, um, if either Huron spoke or someone from a university that put this in motion spoke, like I think getting some real life examples so people can um, tangibly understand like what the process was and what the outcomes were might be helpful. Yeah, and Abby, this is Alman. Do us a favor as a committee and explain to us the difference from the incremental, incremental budget process that we did to an incentive-based budget, and how does that affect deans and faculty? Great. So um, I, I will share a very high-level overview of the difference between incremental and, and incentive-based. <coughs> And again, I'll let the president weigh in and we're going to be talking more about this with the with the board as it develops. But at a very high level, incremental is uh, funding comes into the university, whether it's tuition and fees or state appropriation. There's a certain amount of money that is taken off the top for administrative expenses and then the rest is allocated to schools and colleges. And incremental, we call it that because Basically, there was a decision who knows when ago to give a college or school a certain amount of money, not necessarily based on their activity in the school or college. And so incrementally, year over year, they get a little bit more or less, depending on, you know, discussions between the dean and the provost. So that's our incremental budget. It's basically how we've always done it and just kind of marginal changes. The incentive based budget has a different approach, which is where. You have all the revenue coming into the university. It goes to the schools and colleges based on the activity in those schools and colleges, whether it's credit hours or research activity, and that's what the model helps build. And then there are funds drawn from the colleges back to the administrative units to support expenses like research support or IT support or facilities support. So instead of that administrative cost coming off the top, it's taken from, from the colleges. They get all the revenues first based on their activity, and then the administrative expenses are taken on the back end. And what that does is really, first it allocates revenue based on activity, which is a key piece of this. And in the model, there are different sort of factors that decide how that revenue is allocated, but it also sheds a little light on the administrative side because the colleges and schools know, you know, why am I paying X for IT services and what service level am I going to get for IT services, for example? So it sort of shines light not only on the activities in the schools and colleges, but also the administrative services. So it's a more transparent way of budgeting. Uh, it also puts more responsibilities uh, kind of at the dean's level for decision making based on activities in their college, but it also has the you know additional benefit of having the administrative units also have to talk about why, how they're spending the money they're spending and what service they're giving to the schools and colleges. So that's just a very high level of the difference between the two. 
So, so in the full board meeting, Mark is going to walk us through about how like activities determine what what, what constitutes activity. Is it diff depending on the number of students in that school? I mean, I that's that's what I would I wouldn't. Know. Mark, I, I want to answer that. I think... Sorry, Abby. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just turning to you. Oh, okay. Uh, I just wanted uh, maybe uh, a, a couple of things. First of all, the word uh, incentivized is a very important uh, part of this. And uh, maybe we could actually just take down the screen for a moment so we see everybody. But it, it's. Uh, there's a number of parts. Uh, first of all, uh, this is really about incentivizing the colleges to be able to collaborate with each other, to, to do programs within, to actually understand how they themselves are generating revenue and what are the opportunities. There's a lot of entrepreneurial spirit at the University of Rhode Island, but a priori it's been stifled because uh, the benefits, the understanding of where revenues will go and how they will support uh, programs. So if a college, for example, really wants to build in a particular area, it could be very interdisciplinary with another college. They, for example, want to develop coursework masters or online masters programs that, uh, and there's a real need, for example, in the state of Rhode Island or uh, regionally or nationally, uh, this is uh, brings a lot of transparency. So currently, I think it's very important uh, to note that I don't believe there's anybody um, until recently that could actually talk about the current budget model of the University of Rhode Island and describe it. Um, it's actually taken quite a bit of time on the part of Abby and John Pullman and many other people to to really unpack it, to really understand what are the inputs, what are the outputs. We're in the midst of trying to do budget hearings, both at the administrative level, but also at the college levels to understand how uh, taxes, in a sense, within the university, how we shift uh, resources back and forth. But it uh, it's interesting, a budget model can actually constrain what uh, people do. So this is actually, in a certain sense, uh, re providing the opportunities to the colleges to be entrepreneurial, to be able to build their future. Currently, it's basically, it's going with hat in hand to the provost and hoping that the provost will have uh, those resources. It also gives a lot more transparency for the college deans so they can plan for the future, they can, of course, work with the faculty more closely. So these are a lot of things, but one of the really first important things was really to understand the uh, university budget uh, better. Um, you know, there are a lot of public universities, if you follow the news, that are in trouble and they announce it every day. And part of it is, I think, you know, we have to be in a position to be able to plan for the future and we need people really in those particular areas to be incentivized to work forward. So I don't know if that helps uh, as well. Vahid. It, it does. I, I still, I'm, I guess I'm not clear. And I, I get the concept and it's great. Right? I, I think it's a very good idea the way you're doing it. What constitutes, you know, Abby mentioned the word activity a number of times, right? What constitute? What are those parameters determine as a positive activity, or some colleges not having any activity? Right? Is and a, it'd be good if you share with us some key points of what what those factors are. Right? I, I'm sure when you, when you do the budget that way, there'd be some schools would be happy, some will not be happy. Right? So you're gonna have to deal with that, and you will need to deal with it. But. Yeah, I'm just curious. I don't know how this is or not, but well, look, uh, yeah. the sun shines for everybody, and it should. You know, we have colleges where uh, we have faculty teaching three and three, or four and four, even, and there's also expectations for for them to be doing research. So this sheds a lot of light on uh, on effort, uh, and it's not that we want everybody uh, uh, to be teaching heavy teaching loads, but it's it's becomes more transparent if if we build a professional master's 
program in a particular area. We're able to hire more faculty in that area, but we can also understand uh, what are uh, reasonable teaching loads. Let's remember we're a research university. Our, our educational programs are informed by our research. Um, we it's so important to faculty's research careers also that they remind you know that that they participate in undergraduate teaching you know in terms of the fundamentals but also in graduate teaching where they will also have those opportunities to be challenged the 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 problem at the moment is there is no rhyme or reason why are some teaching four why are some teaching one or less per semester maybe there's good reasons maybe there's historic reasons but this puts it uh, very clear at the moment we have just two levers that we uh, use at the university it's uh, basically um, the the lion's share is undergraduate uh, tuition and then there's a piece that's coming from the state as you know i've been showing also what's happened over the last 20 years in terms of state uh, contributions to the University of Rhode Island, which have been going down. So uh, how we uh, have essentially been budgeting things is we've kept the faculty numbers flat, but we've grown the undergraduate student population, including, of course, out of state students. That strategy has reached its limit, as we also know, you know, we have limits on space, on uh, facilities, on uh, dormitories and so forth. So we have to think about how do we generate revenue that's going to allow us to build, to to repair, maybe a lot of also to help with deferred maintenance, but also to build new programs that are relevant and uh, timely. So, you, you know, one could imagine as we're, you know, we have a very successful computer science program. It's one of our largest majors. How do we grow? How do we hire more faculty in the area of AI? across the campus, how can we build those uh, connections? So a big piece of this is just to be a lot more transparent about the revenue that's coming in. And then to say, look, there's opportunities over the next one, two, three, five years to build in new areas and and uh, restrengthen. So at the moment, uh, we, we have only those two levers. It would be nice to have more levers, including, uh, of course, be more explicit about philanthropy, how that supports different parts of uh, the campus and other uh, opportunities that we have to partner with the state of Rhode Island and with industry and uh, NGOs and other partner uh, government uh, uh, agencies in the state. And if I may, Vahi, also to your point, we are developing as part of the stakeholder engagement, some materials that more clearly outline kind of flows of funds that'll talk about what decision making goes into the flow of funds to schools and colleges based on activity, whether it's like credit hours taught or research grants. So, okay, that that's exactly it. No, no, Timothy and Mark said, I agree with you. It sounds like a great idea, right? But the question I had was, and then you just answered it, is like going into it. Does everyone know what the criteria is in order to qualify? And then you just said that. Yeah, part of the reason we haven't shared it previously is we've been developing it with the steering committee. So we're in yeah. that engagement phase. So uh, to your to your question, I think we can share more about that. Great. No, uh, sounds, sounds good. So. Thank you. Any any other questions on this? All right. So, want to take us to the next item, please? Initial review of the FY twenty six to thirty capital improvement plan. Yes, so uh, if uh, ITS could share this slide back, that would be helpful. So we want to just a few opening comments on this. We're sharing a lot of information with you. My understanding is, you know, previously the board has sort of gotten a high level overview of the capital improvement plan, which the board has to approve. I think what we'd like to do is share more information about how we develop it and all the ongoing projects. So I, this is an extensive slide deck. We're not going to go through all the slides. I want to just focus on kind of some ongoing projects and new proposed projects, but we hope that there'll be a useful reference for you uh, going forward. And if you have questions about specific projects, we can answer them. Uh, and also as a reminder, this is our first discussion of the capital improvement plan. It will come back to the board for approval in June. So this is really an opportunity for discussion and feedback or reaction to what we're proposing, but it's not, it's not final. We'll take your feedback and, and come back in June for approval. Um, so if we could go to the next slide. 
So as a reminder, the capital improvement plan, it's a five-year plan that shows all of our capital projects over a million dollars. We have to submit it to the state in July 1. That's why we bring it to the board for approval in June. There are many levels of approval, which are outlined here. I won't walk through them. Uh, we have internal approvals and we also have a board of trustees approvals and then it has to go to the uh, office of management and budget and then ultimately the general assembly and if we uh, internally want to add a project to the capital improvement plan we have a process internally where stakeholders at the university can say i i have a project i'm interested in there's forms they fill out and there's a vetting process internally before it even makes it on to this to this document next slide please so uh, this covers all of our active buildings. So these red dots show where we actually have active buildings. Uh, we do have about 28% of the state's total real estate portfolio. Uh, it's very large relative to other state agencies and we're constantly advocating for the need for more state support. They're very generous in giving us uh, asset protection and asset renewal uh, dollars, but we do, we do have a large portion of the state's buildings. Next slide, please. Okay. Very briefly, uh, our completed capital improvement plan projects. So we do take some off every year. If we go to the next grid, this is what you're used to seeing, which is a very high level summary of our SIP. Uh, there are three projects that are coming off. One is uh, College of Engineering, uh, which is obviously the Fasciatelli project. Uh, the second is Ranger Phase 2, and the third is the Ryan Institute. So these are projects that you've heard about for several years, but they're complete. So they will be coming off the capital improvement plan for the next submission. Uh, and I don't think I said this, but each capital improvement plan is, it's five years rolling. So you, there are a repeat of projects that come every year. And so really it's kind of a, an add and a remove uh, when we bring it to you each year. Next slide, please. Okay, existing SIP project updates. We have a number of existing SIP projects that are being updated that we just wanna highlight. If you go to the next slide. So um, these are projects that have been on the SIP that uh, have either had kind of budget or schedule changes. And uh, the first is new undergraduate housing. So just as a reminder, this is the, the dorm that we had asked support from the General Assembly to do, which are actually going forward with a public-private partnership approach, which means that if we're successful with that approach, we won't need to build this dorm this way, but we have to keep it on the SIP as um, a project that if we're not successful with the P3 approach, we want to make sure we can move forward to build a dorm. Uh, and that will be through borrowing. As you can see, the initial projected cost of 170 million escalated post COVID has now grown to about 280 million. So it would be very expensive for us to build that sort of suite style dorm, which is part of the reason we're looking at this P3 approach. Next is Fine Arts Center Phase 1B. I'm so excited that we just uh, kind of broke ground on this project. It's been in the making for a long time. We did have uh, bids come back higher than expected, so 8.2 million increase uh, in the bid responses. We are using some funds from asset protection to uh, support that unexpected increase and also using university reserves, but this we needed to get started on this and I'm excited that we are finally uh, seeing it moving. Narragansett at Bay Campus phase one, we also had uh, an overage on the bid increases uh, the 8.6 million is came in the project for Ocean Robotics Laboratory, which is our, our joint GSO engineering project came in 8.6 million over. Uh, I, I do want to say we have a, a, a very thoughtful cost estimating program. We bring in backup estimators, but the, the combination of COVID uh, escalation and construction costs, especially in New England, being up 35% over pre COVID levels have really resulted. These projects sort of originated before COVID. That's why when we finally got to the construction bid phase, I think you all have heard about it. Same with schools and other projects. These were unanticipated uh, based on the fact that they were kind of pre and post COVID. So we're hopeful that we won't have these unanticipated increases going forward. Go ahead, Margo. Do you have a sense of, of our uh, peer institutions and their experience on the relative change in costs? It, I, I, listen, I get construction costs are up. Uh, we're still working through some of the supply issue stuff, COVID. Uh, but it seems like we were way off on a number of these. And I'm curious if we're in comp you know, good company on that or if we're an outlier. 
Uh, I believe we are in good company. What we tend to look at is the broader construction industry and we do track that. I will say New England has higher increases than other parts of the country. And so we really have to look at our peers in New England. Uh, um, but I would say that we're in good company. It doesn't mean that we can't continue to be thoughtful as we're pricing out new new projects, but these increases are not, we're not alone in experiencing these. Armin, do you see this in your world? I know yes, you yes, yeah. everywhere. The, the, the costs have gone up dramatically and it's still not getting any better. Okay. It's everywhere. I see it as well, Margo. We had a project here at the hospital that, that doubled. Oh, wow. Okay, thank you. The, the, the other thing, just quickly, in the construction industry, there were major projects going on in the Middle East where major contractors over the last five years during COVID brought up the entire supply chains to build these projects. It's all coming back to roost now in America that the supply chain is so far off because of these other projects going on around the country, the world rather. And unless you're in the industry, no one would even know that was happening. Might be good, Abby, and I'm sure you do this when, when uh, we're going to the state for some of these things is to provide context that we're not an outlier. In fact, we're trying to control no. this stuff in a world where, like, like um, Maria said, like things are doubling, you know, so just provide some context to it. Yeah. That's helpful. And we do, uh, I, I've been meeting regularly with our for general assembly finance leads to just talk about some of that, you know, they're, they're seeing it across the state agencies, but the, because we have so many projects and we have so, you know, higher percentage of the buildings, there's obviously a lot of attention on you or I, um, that we are really grateful. The state does amazing, uh, gives us amazing support for our capital projects. So I just, uh, relative to other states, I think Rhode Island really, really does a great job there. Um, Okay, Narragansett Bay Campus. Well, phase one, I'll say ORL has also broken ground. So Abby? Yeah, Abby, go ahead. It's Mike. Just a quick question. The other thing I'd not urge you to do is something like the Moral Union. There's a pick, not pick on that, but if we if we knew it was going to cause, a, it sounds like a crazy increase. It doesn't, that doesn't sound like inflation. If we knew that that was $126 million, would we be doing the same project? Would we be doing that, giving that price? Or is that money better used for other things? Because it seems like, you know, when these budget, when these things, when we prove these things, or at least gave the go ahead on the certain things, there was, that was less than sixty million. And now saying it's one twenty six, I'm just, I'm not sure of the answer, but I think we should absolutely question whether how we prioritize and what we do, given if, if in truth, that's true, or what we could do to reduce that scope in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, absolutely. And I, the Memorial Union is a great example of this. So that scope. So some of these projects, as we get down to student help and counseling and Memorial Union really haven't been escalated in recent years. So the big jump is the fact that we've kind of left them at the same level at the CIP for several years. So we're really doing a true up. Um, but the Memorial Union does envision a significant addition to the MU to keep us kind of square footage per student relative to our peers. So, in conversations with the president's executive council, that was part of the question. So, we could increase the, we could decrease the cost of the project and not do the addition. Uh, but the the feeling in our initial discussions uh, is that we really need that addition. We're we're short of space for our students in the MU. So, we're we're hoping to go forward with the existing scope. But we are having those conversations. To your point, Mike, because we don't want to. We need to be thoughtful. We only have so much uh, borrowing that we can do, but there are some needs that really are, are, are critical. Housing is one of them and the MU just giving our students that space for community, especially coming out of COVID. So we do have those discussions. And uh, as, as, as you all know, there are several phases uh, for design and planning, and we have to have those discussions at each phase in the project to make sure that we're scoping it appropriately for what we can afford. But this is sort of our request to the state for what we're hoping to do. Um, okay, just very quickly, um, Narragansett Bay Phase 1 Ocean Robotics Laboratory is the big uh, project that remains. We just broke ground on that. It's very exciting. Uh, Narragansett Bay Phase 2 
Uh, we are uh, in the design process. We had to take a little bit of funds from phase one to support the unexpected increase in the bid to the ocean robotics lab. So we had to adjust our design a little bit for phase two. And that was again, sort of scoping the budget, right? Knowing that we have an envelope of funds available for the Bay campus. So we're in design uh, and look forward to uh, planning for an ocean engineering center and our ocean frontiers GSO research building. Student Health and Counseling and Memorial Union, these have been escalated to be more appropriate costs based on sort of post COVID and construction cost escalation. So uh, that's what you see here and will be reflected on the SIP. And then Academic MEP, that's, uh, these are really critical HVAC projects that have been on the capital improvement plan for many years. There are two, one is Whitehall, which is a, a home of our College of Nursing. We're prioritizing that it needs an entirely new HVAC system. Again, this came in higher than expected, so we are going to have to seek some more RICAP funds to support the second phase of this, which is Fogarty Hall, um, and that will be RICAP funding. So these are just updates to existing projects that will be on the SIP. Any questions on that slide? And I'll move on. Okay, so these are new proposed projects for the capital improvement plan. As I walk through, I think what you'll see is really a heavy emphasis on accurately reflecting our significant need for asset renewal. Uh, so that's some of you can think of that as deferred maintenance. That's the historic term, but I like to think of it more as uh, asset renewal. What we're trying to reflect here accurately to the state is the significant needs we have for our buildings and the age of our physical plants. So I'll walk through just very briefly some of these proposed new projects. If we could go to the next slide. So first is campus accessibility. So we know that we have uh, real challenges with uh, ADA compliance based on the age of our physical plants. So this is kind of a, an umbrella project that would allow us to uh, have some dedicated resources to work on things like restroom improvements, pedestrian improvements, elevator modernizations. You'll see here we have 80 elevators of these 19 or 30 years old or more. It's about a million dollars to build a new elevator. Uh, so this is a significant amount of money. The idea here is that this would be RICAP funds uh, with over a several years with about 3.5 million investment each year. Previously, there was a governor's uh, council on disabilities that actually would give URI and other state agencies funding to support ADA improvements, not at a very high level, but at a, you know, a smaller level, but it was very helpful for us to make incremental progress. They've, they've since decided not to distribute money to us that way, which is part of the reason we're putting this on the SIP as kind of an umbrella project to address accessibility. The next one is building envelope improvements. Uh, I would say the, the biggest piece of this is roofing systems. We have, uh, I think at last count, I know Carl's on the call, about 15 roofs that we know need to be replaced uh, that are kind of actively leaking or having challenges and other envelope issues, you know, windows and other things uh, for outsides of buildings. So this is again just an umbrella project that if we can get a certain amount of funding every year over four years, we can make a significant dent in addressing some of those issues. The next item is Carruthers, which is our library HVAC replacement. So we're uh, spending a good amount of time looking at the library and the value and services it offers to the students. And part of the challenge is that the building has, I think, nine different HVAC systems because it's been added to over the years. And uh, in order to really re-envision the library, which as you all know, is really central to a university student life, we need to at least address the infrastructure piece so that we can then move on to kind of programmatic and making it a really innovative space. So this is a project focused on the library. And then next is campus access control. So uh, we're spending a lot of time uh, talking internally about access control on the campus. We have a number of systems. They're not always the same with our residential buildings and our uh, ENG buildings, which are our general revenue buildings. And obviously for physical security reasons, we want to make sure that we're able to modernize, modernize access to our buildings. So this would allow us to do, we're doing an evaluation of our overall campus access control systems. This would allow us to uh, address some kind of near term needs, and then we'll make sure that we uh, build access control into new building projects in the future. Any questions on that before I go to the next slide? Okay, next slide, please. Okay, these are a few more. No, so new graduate housing, the reason this is here is because it's included as part of our public private partnership. 
uh, effort. And if we uh, are not successful, we want to make sure we have it on the capital improvement plan. This would be to replace our existing graduate village. Um, automotive and administrative services. This is essentially where we're envisioning our new undergraduate dorms going. We need to move our current automotive. Um, we have an auto shop and we have some other service sector buildings that we'll plan around them, but ultimately we want to move them so that they're not in our undergraduate housing district. The next is Narragansett Bay uh, Campus shoreline stabilization. So uh, this is to address significant erosion over the past six months to the access road to the pier. Uh, you know, we've had inches of, of uh, reduction in, in uh, the short, the erosion in recent years. This year we lost feet. We've had a number of significant storms. So we're trying to be really proactive because that is that the critical access to our new pier. We're partnering with the US Army Corps of Engineers. So this we envision would be a cost share between uh, URI, the state, and the Army Corps of Engineers. And then finally, the water tower. Uh, we need to refurbish our water tower and ultimately we need to build a replacement water tower because our campus has grown and we haven't grown our ability to have access to water for uh, kind of pressure issues and fire life safety issues. So we wanted to put that on the, the CIP as well. Any questions on those? Okay. So uh, I wanted to say just very quickly before I go on to the next slide that uh, we did uh, put out an RFQ, an RFI for statements of qualifications for public private partnerships. I've referred to that with the undergraduate housing and graduate housing. Um, and we did get some responses that will be reviewed by our internal committee. And then we are hoping to go out for an RFP uh, in, within a month or so. So that process is moving. We're pleased that we got some responses and look forward to reviewing them. But I don't have a, an update really with any substantive details, but hope to uh, by the time of our next meeting. Do you know approximately how many responses of the interested people or teams? We got four responses. And we had several questions submitted in a pre submission call where we were able to give feedback and answer questions. So uh, we're excited to review those. So next slide, please. Okay, so our geo bond strategy. Uh, another exciting update is uh, we have selected an architect for our campus master plan. I know we talked with this committee about that for a while. We went through an RFP process. Uh, we don't have the purchase order issued, but we're hoping that we're waiting on state purchases to issue that. Uh, so we'll share more about it. Uh, but part of the goal of the campus master plan is to help inform our future capital projects. So I'm talking a lot about asset renewal and deferred maintenance. The campus master plan is kind of more forward thinking. What do we need for research, for teaching, for learning, for student services? And so we've been having a question internally about our next geo bond. So the geo bonds, I think, you know, are every 2 years. Uh, the last SIP that was put in for the FY uh, 26 geo bond, we have a historic quad renovation. Um, I've been uh, having conversations about how we address that, knowing that we don't have to put a geo bond request in on our SIP this year. We will have to put 1 in next year. That's when they act on it because it's every 2 years. Um, should we can we kind of defer the decision making on that so we have the campus master plan so i think we will probably put keep the historic quad on there or some sort of placeholder and indicate in the narrative that we're doing this campus master plan and we anticipate updating our bond request for uh, 26 next year when we have a better sense of the master plan okay so the next slide just gives a, a brief summary of our Kushner authorization. So some of you know, this has been an issue of contention that we have a number of Kushner authorizations, which is what the general assembly provides that allows us to borrow. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that in our next presentation, a little bit about our, our debt profile. Um, I thought it was useful to include this. There are a number of Kushners that have been issued that we haven't actually acted on uh, for some of the projects I've already discussed, student health and counseling, Memorial Union, um, our service sector upgrade and part of that is that we've just been working on prioritizing housing. Uh, we did issue a bond for utility infrastructure last year, uh, but the rest are still outstanding. So I just, I'm trying to make sure that everyone knows that we were aware they're there. They give us authorization, but we're not going to borrow against them until we feel it's financially advantageous to do so. And that's why we haven't acted on them to date. 
Okay, the final slide is just a summary. Uh, we have to give you this, this Excel spreadsheet again. The thing I'll point out to you here is that all the new projects are on the right. They're highlighted in green. Uh, so campus accessibility envelope improvements. Uh, and then they're based on the fiscal year that we anticipate the projects being uh, commencing in. And the big takeaway really here is that it's a $514 million delta from the last CIP. Uh, so it's a big number, but again, we're trying to really accurately represent what our needs are and what our plans are uh, to address our significant physical plant challenges. So happy to answer any questions you might have. All the remainder slides that you have in your deck or background for you, please take a look at them. I am amazed every day by the work that our capital projects and planning teams do to execute on a number of projects. Uh, this is a snapshot in time. The projects are always sort of always evolving, but I wanted to make sure you all had a sense of the number of things we have ongoing. So, any questions? I mean, what's your sense of of uh, success on getting the all the funding that we needed? So, I mean, I I totally get why we're, the variance is there, but it is a big variance. So, what do you think? Oh, I I think. I think it would be challenging for uh, the the governor or the general assembly to be able to give us all of this uh, in one year. I do know you all have heard there are other infrastructure projects in the state of Rhode Island. Some some bridges you may have heard about that I think are really going to impact availability of ride cap funding, which is a lot of what we're asking for. Um, but again, we just are going to continue to advocate that kind of the percentage of buildings we have, we would like to have the amount of support to really match that relative to other state agencies, but um, there are going to be a lot of pressures we're aware, uh, especially on capital capital funds in the coming years. So we're going to have to prioritize. Which I'm sure you're thinking about. Absolutely. So the, the, the spreadsheet you just saw kind of has our initial prioritization. I think if we could get even sort of small tranches to each of those, even if it's not the full ask, that would be helpful. Uh, but that'll be part of our conversations with, with the OMB and the governor's office and the general assembly, as we always do as we're advocating for, for state support. Thanks. Thank you, Abby. The next item is review of university tech. Great. Thank you. So Sorry, I disappeared for a couple of minutes that my doctor called me to add a ticket. So my prescription. Glad you're back. Hope everything's okay. Um, okay, so I'm also going to go through this quickly, uh, but my goal in this presentation is just to give you all a snapshot of our current debt profile. Uh, we'll talk later that I've also added this as a regular item in April. I, I think we've come to the board when we want to issue a bond or to talk generally about our capital improvement plan, but not recently sort of said this is an overview of our URI debt. So that's really the goal of this presentation. I'm going to, I'm going to walk through it. Happy to answer any questions and we can evolve it based on your feedback uh, going forward. So, if possible to share the slide deck, that would be great to get us started. If if I need to share it, I'm, I can as well, Michelle. Just let me know. Excellent. Thank you, Katie. Okay, so um, at a very high level, uh, we'll go to the first slide. So basically, URI has access to two types of bonds. I think it's really important to distinguish between these two because there's not always clarity. The first is general obligation bonds. Those are approved by the General Assembly. They're voted on by Rhode Island voters. They're issued by the state and the debt service is paid by the state. This is a really amazing thing that we have in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, kind of every two years, we have a request for a geo bond. And that's really supported some of our major, major capital projects at URI. The second is revenue bonds. So these are bonds that are uh, we have approval by the General Assembly to borrow, and that's the Kushner I mentioned in the last presentation, but they're issued by URI through Ryback, and the debt service is paid by URI. And there are two types of those revenue bonds. There's education in general and auxiliary. 
So as a reminder, our auxiliary buildings are things like housing and uh, our residential dorms, our dining facilities, those have to be sort of self-supporting. And then our education in general, things like classroom buildings and lab buildings that are supported by tuition and fees. So I just wanted to give that, that high level vision of the two. This presentation is gonna really focus on our revenue bonds uh, since they're the ones that we have to manage within our, within our budget. Next slide, please. Next one. Okay, so this is just a list of our outstanding bonds. Uh, you'll notice they're, they're named by year that they were issued. A couple of points on this one. This outlines each of the bond issuances, the principal that's outstanding, the lien, so that's whether it's an auxiliary bond or an education in general bond, when the bonds mature. And then one thing to note is that the borrowers, we're generally the primary borrower, but as you know, we used to be under the Office of Post-Secondary Counsel, so there are some bonds that went out in partnership with URI. RIC and CCRI, but we're only responsible for the debt service on our portion. So those are the percentages outlined there. But this is just a high level snapshot of our of our outstanding debt. Next slide, please. So this gives us our debt service by type. Uh, so the top is um, an overview of our debt service, like a timeline with principal and interest. I have to point out here uh, that actually the legend is is flipped. So actually, the the gray is uh, principal. The the blue is interest. So uh, I want to point out that error there. You may have picked up on that. So I apologize. But this kind of gives you a sense of where we are over time. And if you think about that, you know, the opportunity to borrow if we were sort of keep flat where we are, that sort of represents graphically like how much we could borrow to continue flat in our operating budget. If our operating budget grows, we could have the potential to borrow more. But we were always thinking about borrowing based on that sort of long time time horizon. Uh, the lower left hand service debt service by lien that just shows you auxiliary versus um, E and G revenue bonds, and then on the right it's actually by series. So that's just by color. That that table in the prior prior slide it outlines each of the bond issuances by by issuance. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is an important note. So we have about we have 248 million in outstanding revenue bond principal, and about 85% of that is callable prior to the final maturity. So uh, we do work. Much of this has been done in partnership with our uh, our financial advisors, Hilltop Securities. They've been really excellent. They work with a lot of higher education institutions, and we're sort of constantly talking to them about what our strategy is. So you know, is it an opportunity to um, if the market conditions are favorable, could we do advanced refunding? Uh, or how do we want to approach the bonds that are callable uh, if we can take advantage of lower interest rates? So we do have a number coming up in future years, and that's part of the conversations that we'll have with our financial advisors about how we want to address that. Next slide, please. So just so you know, we're rated uh, by Moody's and S&P. So these are just some examples uh, of Moody's ratings. Um, some of our strengths that I think apply to what Moody's and S&P both look at us uh, for are that we're a flagship university, we have stable enrollment, we have state funding. I think some of our weaknesses are that we have kind of lower um, financial resources relative to some of our peers, and we'll get into that in some of the future slides. Uh, but generally, we work very closely with both of the rating agencies, and we meet with them regularly to share kind of key things that they pay attention to as they're considering higher education institutions. So we're pleased uh, that we have these ratings um, and with the relationship we have with both of them. So the next slide is just the S&P version uh, of what our ratings are. Abby, this, mm -hmm. uh, this is Amin. First of all, the, the presentation of these charts, in my opinion, are outstanding. It's in, even in the past meeting that we just did, um, with the other charts on the insurances to put us all up to speed as to every aspect of the university. And having said that, right now we have an obligation on the revenue bonds, which is surely ours at 248 million. Are we at tilt at 248 million? Or what possibly more exposure do we have that we can go out 
for auxiliary bonds to do some building on our own and repairs on our own? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's part of the reason I wanted to bring this to you. So, uh, as you saw in this, in the CIP presentation, we've recently kind of updated all the costs for our projects. And so the next step is working with our financial advisors to look at our current debt service and to think about what we can prioritize to borrow. I think we really need clarity on the housing piece because that needs to be our priority. And if the P3 approach is not successful, we need to prioritize building a residence hall, but we do have opportunity. We do have opportunity to borrow. It's just a question of how are we prioritizing our projects? So we're in active conversations with them and I'm happy to kind of bring that back to the board regularly and share our thinking about what what um, capabilities are there. But there is see, there is see, another thing too is from some of the calls that we're getting, at least I'm getting on the P3, we're actually a victim of our success, meaning that our tuition levels are very low, uh, not comparable to up the East Coast, but in general, but for the service that we give with the schools and education that we have, which then puts our boarding fees low. And when you do these P3s, I think one of the issues that they're going to come in with is that if we tell them they can only charge at the point of what our price point is, well, then over 35, 40 years of them maintaining this undergrad and grad housing, I, I, it's not going to work. So we're going to probably have to have some cash to be able to do the P3 deals also. I just, at least that's feedback that I'm getting. Are you getting similar? Absolutely. And those were some of the questions that came in our pre-submission discussions uh, around the P3 request for qualifications. And part of the reason that Kushner is there is it gives us the ability to borrow if we need to, to uh, uh, help make the, the P3 approach work. I, ideally, we would not have to do that. I mean, the, the goal of a P3 is to try to find a way for uh, another entity to help uh, build, maintain, finance these dorms, but we we recognize that that will be potentially part of the conversation, and that's why we're not moving forward on any of the other projects because we really need to prioritize housing and we need to get clarity on yeah. where okay. it's going in financially. Okay. But you're but you're absolutely right. We, I think you know our dorms have various uh, rates based on the the quality of the dorm and the and the communities in the dorm, but we also have to pay attention to sort of equity and we want to make sure that our students all have access to housing that that fits for them. So this is all part of the very complicated uh, analysis of these these proposals. So thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, our next slide, I just want to give this is just the peer analysis. So the next slide lists our peers. These are our peers that have similar credit ratings just for context, not necessarily most of our uh, our um, New England colleagues are on here, but not all of them. And there uh, are some others across the country. So just a few highlights of where URI stands relative to other institutions. If we go to the next slide, um, this just gives you, uh, and these are based on Moody's numbers. So they take our FY23 financials and they make some adjustments based on how they look at the whole industry. So they're kind of comparing apples to apples. So, um, this is drawn from Moody's data. I just want everyone to be clear about that. But if you look at kind of FTE enrollment, we've highlighted our New England peers. You also see the public median there. Uh, so our enrollment, we have, we're smaller than a lot of our New England peers. Uh, UVM is, is slightly smaller, but the rest are, are larger. And then our net tuition per, per student is also on the lower end. Um, and I think it's important that the Moody's public median, as I mentioned, this is looking at all of those institutions on the prior slide, which is why that median is so low, but relative in New England, we are we are on the lower end. Next slide, please. So this is just a sense of our operating revenue uh, and expenses. So um, you'll see we have we have lower operating revenue. It's just based on the size of the university. Uh, you see, you know, UMass is over on the left hand side. They're much bigger than we are. We're kind of lower generally than the Moody's median. And same on the operating expenses. And I do want to point out, if you look at this, that our expenses appear to be higher than our revenues. Um, we actually did end up kind of in the positive in FY23, if you look at our financial statements. But Moody's makes some adjustments to our data based on 
national, how they're assessing all the national institutions, which is why it appears that we were in the negative with expenses more than revenues. Um, I have our controller here who can get into the details of that if needed, but I just wanted to point that out that that's based on some adjustments that Moody's makes when they're looking at schools across the country. So the next slide is an important one that's really operating cash flow margin. So this really measures the level of cash flow from operations that's available to cover our principal and interest payment on debt. Uh, historically, we're below the median, which means our kind of operating income is lower relative, relative to our uh, revenue. If we were to increase tuition or increase state appropriations, that would improve that ratio. Another way to improve it is to, you know, reduce our expenses, but I think everyone here at URI knows that we're really uh, low on the expense side relative to what we're trying to accomplish here at the university. Uh, but uh, this is something that is kind of one of the key things that Moody's looks at when they're considering what our credit, rate, credit rating is. So important peer uh, comparison. And then finally, the next slide talks about our financial uh, cash and investments. So this includes our cash and also it does include our uh, uh, foundation um, investments. So they're considered a component unit and actually that's been kind of part of the, the conversation about with our credit rating agencies, because the foundation is separate. They didn't, they weren't necessarily uh, including the foundation investments as URI investments. And I give credit to uh, BP Ryder, who really made the argument that those are in fact URI, uh, URI funds that's are basically dedicated in support of URI. So they should be included in that. So this days of cash on hand here is, is 137 in the lower graph. Uh, I would say that um, there's always room to improve here. This has been, this is kind of a key thing that universities look at. You've probably heard about other universities like Arizona. This has been, this is one of the issues they ran into financially is a, a miscalculation of days of cash on hand. So we're sort of always looking at this, which is essentially like how long could we operate if we had a major disruption to our, to our revenues. So uh, you see where we are relative to peers and that's something we're, we're always kind of paying attention to. I mean, we shared a chart like this with with Lil, who might in turn share this in like an alumni magazine or something. I mean, it's I know we're doing a great job of raising assets in the foundation, but it's stunning versus peers. Uh, I have not shared this specifically with Lil. I mean, she's part of our executive team, so so she's seen it. Uh, but I, but I hear your point and I know that that the foundation is constantly benchmarking against peers uh, and that, that we have uh, room to bring in more fundraising uh, relative to our peers. So I know that's a constant source of attention for the foundation. I mean, it should be a, a source of attention for alum to understand the situation. But anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up with her. So I think that's my last slide. Again, the goal of this, oh, no, I have one more. Sorry, this is our debt service. This is the important one. So this is our relative debt service. Um, this is really important. It just shows here, this is a good thing that we're kind of on the right-hand side. We have other universities that are much more leveraged than we are. So you look at UMass, UConn, uh, our debt service coverage is 2.2. We have requirements around debt service coverage, which is essentially how, much, how many funds you have available to pay your debt service. Uh, we have different requirements, whether it's an EMG bond or an auxiliary bond. Uh, we're above the requirements at 2.2. That's a positive thing, but that's something we take into account as we consider future borrowing, as we want to make sure we don't get down below the 1.0 or the 1.2 uh, requirement. So this is just where we stand relative to peers in our in our uh, our debt service uh, and our total adjusted debt. I think that's the last slide. So happy to have this be a continued conversation, um, especially as we come to you and talk about our capital projects and what our path forward is for borrowing to support some of them and, and seeking state support for others. I think this is really an important component of our decision making. So thanks for your attention to this. Well, thanks for bringing it up, Abby. It was good. Any questions for Abby? There be no question. Good next one. You're still up, Abby. Approval under the delegation of authority to the president relating to the land and property. 
Great, thank you. So I don't have a presentation for this. This is just a reminder that the president does have a uh, delegation to execute on certain real estate transactions uh, on behalf of the board. And we have a requirement to report to you on those delegations. Uh, since the last February meeting, there were two actions that were taken. One was a business accelerator license agreement between East Stroudsburg University of Pennsylvania and URI uh, on behalf of the Department of Plant Science. So this was essentially uh, some office space at East Stroudsburg for a faculty member to use uh, for USDA supported research uh, that was approved by the State Properties Committee uh, in February of this year. And then second was an amendment to a facility use and license agreement between URI and the Rhode Island Research Foundation. So uh, as reported previously, we're doing some renovations on the uh, Ocean Technology Center on the Bay Campus to allow for some incubator space. Uh, it's not really incubator space, actually companies, uh, faculty companies are, are um, entering into the OTC building uh, and operating out of the OTC building. And we had to do some renovations to make it uh, ready for them. And this was an amendment to the original facility use agreement that allowed for more space for storage for these companies outside of the building. So those are just two items that uh, we took to state properties on behalf of the board. So this is just an FYI. Any questions, anyone? So moving along. So update on the e procurement implementation. Okay, great. So uh, I do have a slide deck on this. This is really just uh, awareness for the board. I think uh, we shared with you last year that we were uh, embarking on um, uh, uh, IT implementation to help modernize our procurement system. So. Uh, we work uh, with state purchasing <coughs> and board uh, has its own procurement regulations. So this effort uh, doesn't change that. This is just an effort to have a, a modern system that allows our users to implement on purchasing in a more effective way. So uh, the software that you may have heard us refer to in the past is called Jagger. It's a kind of best in class for uh, higher education and other industries. Uh, we have called this effort roadie buy. So that's the term of art we're using, uh, but the software behind it is Jagger. And I just wanted to give a very high level update on where we are with this project. So if we go to the next slide. So this is uh, alignment with our strategic plan priority four, which is powering the university of the future. And one of the goals and actions in that plan is to implement financial systems and practices that provide stability and flexibility to make strategic investments. So. I think this fits really well with that uh, action plan. Uh, and the goal is for this procure to pay system is to streamline purchasing process for customers and suppliers, provide really uh, helpful procurement data and analytics so we can be more kind of strategic in our procurement efforts and ideally produce overall cost savings for the institution. And again, I wanna make it clear that this is all kind of within the bounds of the, the state of Rhode Island purchasing regulations and board of trustees uh, procurement regulations that we operate under. Next slide. So why are we doing this? Uh, we want to help improve the user and uh, the user experience. So these are faculty and staff and students at some points in our in our schools and colleges that are trying to purchase things to. Uh, to meet the mission, we want to reduce complexity of invoice approval and payments. We want to modernize access to data, reduce administrative burden, and improve customer service. Um, that's really kind of the end user, the people in the in the schools and colleges that are trying to get things done. There's also a lot of benefit on the sourcing and procurement side. So this helps with uh, reducing cycle time for suppliers that want to work with the university. Right now, we accept paper bids. I mean, it's amazing the amount of work we do. I really applaud Tracy Angel, our AVP for strategic procurement and her team. They, they operate in a very paper-based world, uh, which as you can imagine, makes things slow and, and burdensome. So we're hoping to reduce some of that burden by having uh, registration uh, electronically and having some of this processing happening electronically. And again, this allows for better data, better understanding of who our suppliers are so that we can make more strategic decisions on how we're procuring materials. Next slide, please. So at a very high level, what are the benefits? We hope we can uh, order things faster. We want to have improved visibility, improved visibility into purchases. 
Uh, the system is, uh, we're designing it specific to URI. And then we, as I mentioned earlier, we want to have an enhanced supplier management uh, that really helps people who want to work with URI uh, get into our system and, and provide us services. Slide, please. Okay, so where are we? Uh, this this project has been going on for, uh, I guess, almost a year. Uh, it was started, I think, in January of last year. We we do have an implementation partner that's helping us. Uh, we've been busy working on kind of designing and configuring the system, and now we're in the the very critical kind of integration and validation phase. So we have a group of um, pilot departments at the university that uh, once we finalize building the system, we will go live with some pilots. Those are a couple of our colleges and uh, our facilities administrative unit um, to try to test the system and integrate it into our existing financial systems. And then we'll have a pretty phased rollout uh, throughout the end of the calendar year based on how that pilot goes. We'll introduce new, new departments into the system. So we're trying to be thoughtful and really integrate change management uh, in this process. There's a lot going on with the, uh, the IBB model and e-procurement, and so we know that a phased approach is probably the best approach for the campus, but we're in right now we're trying to just test it and make sure the system, the system works. And then I think the next slide is just an overview of the timeline. So as you see here, I mentioned the pilot group, so that's going to be working kind of spring into summer. We're doing the testing. Uh, now, over the next month or so, we have this change management effort where we need to train people to use the new system, and then we're hoping to have this phased approach uh, through the end of the calendar year where we bring additional units on. So that's a very high level quick summary. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay. No questions. Uh, let's just keep going, Abby, please. Update on classification and compensation study. Okay, so this is another initiative that uh, we've been trying to kind of execute on for a few years, and it's finally starting, which I am excited about, which is uh, working to modernize our classification and compensation system, which is really critical to our HR department and our HR function. Um, I only have a couple of slides on this. I think we'll, we'll come talk to you about it more uh, as the process moves forward, but essentially, we do have a, a consultant also helping us with this who does this. Um, we did an RFP through state purchasing um, and they are looking at a number of things and I'll give you a, a summary here of what the outcomes we hope of this study will be if you go to the next slide. And Amory Coleman is here, our AVP for HR who's really leading the charge on this and I'm so thankful for her team. Uh, and she can answer any particular questions, but essentially this is what we're hoping to get out of this study. The time frame is about a year. We just got started uh, about a month and a half ago. Um, we're hoping to have a new job classification architecture, including new job profiles. So some of our job profiles haven't been updated in years and years, and we have you know hundreds of them that have kind of one person in them, which really isn't a best a best practice from an HR standpoint. We're looking at pay plans, and that includes. Um, I should have said this up front. This is all of our employees except for our state classified employees and our faculty. So this is all our uh, union employees that are not state classified employees and um, our non-union, non-classified employees. It gets a little complicated with the number of different types of employees we have, but I wanna make sure everyone is aware that that's the audience that we're looking at for this study. So we're looking at pay plan structures. That includes looking at the different union pay plans our non-union, non-classified pay plans really tying it to market, so a market study and how are we looking at job profiles and pay, pay ranges and tying them to, to where the market is. We are hoping to have a new compensation administration manual that comes out of this that really explains our compensation philosophy and makes it more clear to our community how we address compensation as a university. Uh, this will also include a preliminary FLSA review, so that's the Favor Labor and Standards Act. Uh, some of you may be aware if it impacts your industries, uh, there are kind of changes around uh, minimum thresholds for uh, overtime and uh, with employees. That, that's a federal uh, federal changes that we're tracking. So this study will also look at the impacts of that to our campus. And then finally, change management is really important. So kind of a roadmap for how we're implementing these changes and a communications plan. Um, the next slide will just give you 
kind of a summary of how we're trying to tie our employees and our our job descriptions to the market. So this is really hopefully we'll end up with this cohesive compensation program. So we're looking at different employee segments. We're looking at market definitions. We're trying to match job titles at URI to job titles in other markets. We're trying to have standard you know, terms and definitions. And then at the end, it's really tying to compensation. And it's really important to note, this is a study. This is a process that will take us about a year and at the end, we'll have all those deliverables I talked about, but implementation is a whole other conversation. So part of it is defining the problem. That's what we're trying to do. So where are we tied to market? Where are we below market? Where might we be above market? And then implementation of the recommendations will be a multi-year plan that will have to be incorporated into our kind of multi-year financial planning. If we do, for example, find that there are groups of job job areas where we're well below market and we want to bring up to market, we need to plan thoughtfully for that financially. So this is really about doing the analysis, looking at these job profiles, looking at our compensation systems. There'll be a series of recommendations which, which we'll then have to address over the course of time. So that's a very high level summary. We can share more uh, as the project goes along, but I wanted to make sure you were aware of it in case you get questions. Um, we are, we've been uh, working on this uh, current state, establishing foundations, developing job profiles. We're about to go out to kind of a more public phase with the university. We've been doing a lot of stakeholder interviews, but now uh, there'll be more sort of broad community awareness of this work going on and the change management, and we'll have a website that'll explain it. But you may get questions as, as members of the board. So we wanted to make sure you knew what was going on. And you can certainly refer anything to myself or Anne Marie Coleman, who's really leading the charge. Thank you. Uh, next one, Abby, is update on the university policy on approval and execution of contracts and other binding documents. Great. So uh, I am going to turn to Alyssa Boss for this, but uh, this discussion is just a discussion at this point, not an action. We're trying to memorialize and update that contracts and binding documents policy to address some of the things that this committee has talked about before. Uh, so I'm going to turn to Alyssa and let her give an overview of where we are with this. Sure, there's effectively uh, three areas of material change. Um, the first is we have had a process in which authorized signatories can delegate uh, to other people within their unit. And we had a, a annual renewal of that. We're proposing to remove that annual renewal just because we end up with periods in which we don't have those delegates while people are getting those renewals updates. So that's the first proposed change in 2.2.1. The second material change is uh, an exception to the board of trustees approval requirement for contracts over 5 million when it is basically the university participating in a state agreement. So these are master price agreements of the state uh, where we don't we don't actually negotiate uh, those contracts and are participating under a state agreement. So that's the second proposed change. And the third really does relate to a prior discussion um, that Abby did have with this committee related to how we interpret changes and amendments to contracts that effectively result in bringing a contract that was under a dollar threshold for approval, and then the amendment or change order brought it over that dollar threshold, and sort of formalizing how we deal with those situations. And what we don't want to do is have a situation in which a contract was 4.9 million, and we enter into a you know $150,000 amendment to it, and now suddenly it's over 5 million. Uh, it's not a material change. Uh, it's simply a change order. For instance, a uh, you know. A project or materials that we needed more of than we originally thought we did. Um, that you know what what we're proposing here is that in those circumstances, uh, the president's approval is required, uh, but it only needs to come to the board uh, when it brings it over that threshold if the change is actually material. So if it's you know to give a more extreme example, if it was you know a four point nine nine million dollar contract and we have a you know, a hundred or ten thousand dollar change. We don't want that to have to come to the board, and so we proposed a materiality threshold for it coming back to the board based on the original amount uh, of the contract when it was originally approved. 
of uh, $1 million or 20%. Uh, and so that's what we're proposing. And as Abby said, this is not here for approval right now. It has some additional steps to go through, but we wanted to bring it here and make sure this committee has the opportunity to ask any questions and provide any feedback on that proposed approach. Any questions? Great, thank you, Alyssa. And I think this will also go to governance. So governance is where uh, we also discuss policy changes and they act on the policy changes, but we wanna make sure that since it's relative to the, the charter of this committee that you all hear about it as well. And the final uh, discussion item is the annual review of the finance and facilities committee charter and calendar. So the few things there, including the debt review that we want to. Yeah. Thank you. So, so uh, according to our finance and facilities committee charter, we have to review the charter and calendar every uh, year in April and then act on any changes in June. So, um, based on the fact that I've been in the interim role for almost a year, I uh, took the liberty of proposing some changes to our charter and our calendar uh, relative to the presentations we saw today. So, one of <laughs> is adding a review, kind of an annual review of our, the university's debt to the April uh, board meeting when we first bring the capital improvement plan, because I think those two uh, items really dovetail nicely. Also wanted to uh, clarify some language in the charter about the review of the cap campus master plan. So we're, we're embarking on that new that new uh, planning effort soon. On the calendar, I would say the big items are moving approval of the tuition and fees from September to February. So I think you all remember that we did that for the first time this year to allow us more uh, kind of information on enrollment and make a more informed approach from recommendation for all of you to approve tuition and fees, uh, adding the review of university debt in April. Uh, we did have an annual procurement update in November. I mean, in, on the April meeting, I'm recommending we move it to November. I did just give you an update on Rody by because it's still technically on our calendar right now. Uh, but I think we should move that to November to allow more time for the debt and capital improvement discussion in April. And then finally, uh, we are taking approach. Uh, we, as you know, our strategic plan has four priority areas. We want to make sure that we're coming to the finance and facilities committee to talk about the key performance indicators, particularly in priority four, which is powering the university of the future. And we're proposing that we come to you with that uh, in November and then annually thereafter. So those are the big changes to the charter and the calendar. Happy to get your feedback. And again, we don't have to act on this today. It would be for, for June, but wanted to share our proposals. I don't hear any questions or comments. So, and we talked about this before. So, that's the end of our discussion items. Next, we get to the action items. The action item, the first action item, we have the approval of real estate transaction with the East Farm Commercial Fisheries Center and the Commercial Fisheries Research Foundation and the negotiation and execution of all documents relating to such transaction and recommendation to the URI Board of Trustees. Abby, Carl, Ryan, I'm not sure who's. Yeah, I'll, I'll kick it off. So, uh, in discussions with uh, the chair and vice chair of this committee, we're proposing a slightly different way to have the board consider real estate transactions, which is to uh, look at a term sheet that outlines the major uh, areas of each of the real estate transactions and the fundamental things that need to be involved in the final documents. So, we're hoping that the, this committee and the board will be open to an approval of a term sheet. And you probably have you see some examples of those in the action items that we're going to discuss that would allow us some flexibility to actually kind of execute on the actual documents between board meetings uh, and gives us some more flexibility with the state properties committee because everything we bring to the board has to go to the state properties committee so it, there's a multi step process. Uh, I, I think this approach has 2 benefits. I actually think it's more clear for you as board members if we summarize the high level uh, kind of areas in the term sheet so you know what you're approving as opposed to having to dig through you know an entire 40 page lease for those terms um but i so i think that's part of it and i think also it allows us as i said to kind of be more nimble in the way we execute on these real estate transactions between board meetings so uh before i talk about the action items i just wanted to talk about this approach uh the chair and vice chair seemed open to it but i of course welcome feedback from the members of the committee if this is not advisable um, as we move forward. Silence is golden, Abby. Okay, great. So, 
Uh, I'm going to just go through these at a very high level. We, we do have uh, Ryan and Dulce uh, from our real estate team that can answer more detailed questions. And Ryan is going to show some pictures. A picture is worth a, a thousand words. So this is our first action item, which is approval of a real estate uh, transaction with the East Farm Commercial Fisheries Center and the Commercial Fisheries Research Foundation. So uh, we are seeking approval from the board for a real estate transaction where we would license a portion of land uh, at 61 C East Farm Road in Kingston to this organization uh, for the purposes of allowing commercial fisheries to construct, own, maintain, and operating a building on the site. Uh, commercial fisheries has been on the site since 2003. We have a very positive relationship with this organization. They currently occupy and maintain the building at 61 B East Farm Road, and they want to expand by building a new 50 by 30 foot building uh, at East Farm. And we are favorable for this. Again, the relationship is a, is a positive one. Uh, the, the building they're proposing uh, would be for their benefit initially, but of, uh, ultimately we think it would be a benefit to the university if and when the relationship uh, terminates. So we are recommending approval of this and we'll allow uh, Ryan or Dulcie to add any additional points that they think the board should hear. Before just want to highlight, yeah, just want to highlight that the the picture of the dilapidated Quonset hut is actually uh, that building will come down and that's the site that will be used for the new structure. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? This is Ahmed. I'll make the motion. A second. May I have a second for the motion? I second Maria Dusher. Uh, all in favor, please say yes. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, those uh, motion passes. Can I just state, uh, Vahid, for the record, that that is the motion as stated in the memo that was distributed to the board? Yes. Do you want me to read it out? I, I don't think it needs to be read out as long as okay. there's thing in the record that indicates what okay. motion we're referring to. Yes. Perfect. And I think it's important to note that that motion language has been adjusted to reflect the term sheet approval of the transaction and how we would move forward. So thank you for. For clarifying that, uh, Alyssa. Okay. Uh, action item two: approval of the exercise, the option to purchase on Seven Plains Road, Kingstown. Yeah. Okay. Seventy-five and eighty-five Briar Lane. So uh, what is very. Uh, oh, sorry about that. No, go ahead. Uh, at a very high level, these are two buildings that are uh, owned technically by the URI Foundation. Uh, one is 177 Plains Road. It's where our environmental health and safety and some of our other public safety units are housed. And the second is 75 and 85 Briar Lane, which is where our uh, one of the locations where our police department is housed. Uh, in May 2000, the university entered into a, a lease purchase agreement with the foundation. So they actually purchased those buildings uh, on our behalf with the option for us to transfer them ultimately to the university's property list. So we have uh, gone through the analysis with our uh, legal counsel and the foundation's legal counsel, and we'd like to start the process to transfer those buildings officially from the foundation to the university. And again, I'll just let Ryan or, or Dulcie add anything uh, relevant to this, this action item. No further, nothing further. Are there other buildings in this same situation that the foundation has? I think these are the two that are outstanding. We we are in conversations with the foundation about uh, the role they might play more strategically. You know, they did this back in 2000, uh, but I think there are some opportunities uh, for some real estate transactions in the future. But I believe, Ryan, correct me, I think these are the only two that are outstanding. Correct. These are the only two that we have that they have title to that we have the intention of, of gaining title. So they own their own building for the, for the URI Foundation. Okay, thanks. So, I will. Any other questions? I guess this time I'll read. We have a motion that the Finance and Facilities Committee recommend that the URI Board of Trustees approve the request to exercise the university options to acquire title to the properties located at 177 Plains Road and 75 and 85 Briar Lane, Kingston, Rhode Island, and is granted to the university pursuant to the provisions of those lease purchase agreements related thereto and presented and that the board chair 
president and vice president of administration and finance are each individually authorized or on behalf of the university and the board of trustees to take all such actions with all such documents as the person deems necessary and appropriate in furtherance of exercising such options and consummating the condition of the foregoing properties as recommended and presented. This is Amon, so moved. Yo, former call a second. Uh, may I have a voice vote? All in favor? Yes. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Uh, Abby, take it away. Item C. Okay, so the next is an update on the URI uh, Tomacog Indian Memorial Museum. So, uh, as the board is aware, there was an uh, agreement with the Tomacog Museum to lease um, some land on Ministerial Road to build their new museum. We've been in extensive conversations, uh, really led by President Parlange with the Tomacog Museum about. Uh, what we view as a kind of preferred location closer to the campus that would allow for better connections with the URI community and more visibility for the museum. And so uh, what we're proposing here is a term sheet by which we would shift the location that was previously agreed to for the Tomacog Museum to uh, 3045 Kingstown Road, uh, and it would involve the licensing of 3.10 acres uh, so the building that you see here, that would include a kind of incorporation of the former International Scholar Athlete Building in the design process for Tomaquag. Uh, we are uh, kind of working closely with them on what the design might look like for this, uh, but this is an update to the existing agreement. And I, I do want to, I don't know, President Parlange, if you want to say anything about this, I know you've really been kind of leading the discussions with the Tomaquag Museum, uh, but if not, that's that's the summary of what we're trying to do here. Yeah, it's uh, obviously it's an important uh, uh, location, sort of a gateway to the university at 138. Um, obviously, also an important uh, location uh, on the bike path. It's it's close to some of our main College of Health Sciences. We believe that uh, um, there'll be there'll be positive things also for our community uh, in terms of exploring in the future. Uh, connections for museum studies. Uh, so we believe that this location makes a lot more sense and it'll be good for the museum, but it'll also be good for the university. No more questions. Then may I have a motion that the finance and facilities can recommend that the URI Board of Trustees approve licensing real estate at 3045 Kingston Road to the Tomahawk Indian Museum on substantially the terms outlined in the enclosed term sheet. The board chair, president, and the president of administration and finance are individually authorized for and behalf of the universal board of trustees to negotiate and execute a real estate license agreement and any other documents relating to such transactions and substantially the terms outlined in the endorsed term sheet. With any such changes and additional terms as are deemed necessary and appropriate by the person executing the same. Joe Formical, so moved. May I have a second? Maria Ducharm, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Abby, please, number four. Great, so this is our, our final action item in this session, uh, which is to seek approval from the board to execute an easement agreement with the Rita Santilli Revocable Trust, uh, Mario and Dolores Petrarca and Lucia Santilli for a revocable easement at URI's Alton Joan campus. So what this seeks to address is an accidental driveway uh, and storage building encroachment on uh, land that we own at the Alton Jones campus. We've been in conversation with the landowners for several years and have uh, agreed to a revocable easement. So this, this driveway and, and storage building do not impede on any current plans for the Alton Jones campus, but we wanna make sure the easement is revocable uh, so that if we do have future plans, we have the ability to address it in the future. But for now, this would grant them an easement so they can continue to have access on our land to get to them. Any questions? 
So, may I have a motion that the finance of facilities can be recommended that the URI Board of Trustees approve their revocable decent agreement with Retail Santillini, uh, revoc revocable trust Mario and Dolores Pitaka, Lucia Santilli, and West Cornish, Rhode Island, recommended and presented, and the Board Chair President and Vice President of Administration of Finance. Are each individually authorized for and on behalf of the university and the board of trustees to execute their revocable agreement as recommended. This is on so moved. Joe former call a second. Thank you, Armin and Joe. Uh, all in favor, please say yes. 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 Opposed. Abstentions. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is executive session. Uh, the the uh, committee may seek to enter an executive session for the following item. Just want to provide on general law 42-46-5A5, discussion and consideration of acquisition of real estate property for public purposes where advanced public information would be detrimental to the interest of the public. Uh, at this point, I think I look, it looks like I have to ask for a motion to go into the right question. Um, and this is on um, the move to executive session. Second, Mike Vestatelli. Uh, may I have uh, been a voice call vote on this? All in favor, please say yes. Yes. No. I'm opposed, no. Sorry. Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously and we'll ask to into executive session. You're going to all get the.
Okay, we are live. Everyone is automatically muted due to the system. So the Finance and Facilities Committee of the ORI Board of Trustees is now convened into open session. The first order of business in open session is the motion to seal the executive session minutes. May I have a motion? This is arm and move, so moved. Second? Maria, yes, second. Uh, any discussions? Uh, there being no discussion, uh, I ask for a voice vote. All in favor, please say yes. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Uh, motion is approved. The next item of the agenda is item number five. For those of you who've been waiting a long time for this, I was going to try and read something long to say adjourn, but I have a motion to adjourn. Joe Formicola, so moved. Second, Mike Fasatelli. All in favor? Yes. 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 Opposed? No abstentions, I assume. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abby. It was a really good Thank meeting. You. Thank you very Thank much. You, Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Abby.